Welcome back for another episode. And tonight we're going to be discussing Jean-Francois Lyotard, the sublime, postmodernism, and tragedy. And I guess that's quite a menu. And I guess I'll just begin by explaining how I got to this topic. Last week we were discussing Foucault and the relationship between Foucault Foucault and the postmodern. And so I thought it would be a natural bridge point into a fuller discussion of postmodernism. And I happen to have a book called The Postmodern Reader that I think is a very good collection. It's edited by Thomas Doherty. Perhaps it's pronounced Doherty. I'm not sure. D O C H. E-R-T-Y, and I have found all the articles in this volume, which is called Postmodernism, a Reader, to be um, very well written, very interesting articles. So I'm giving it my recommendation based on my own personal interests in, in reading. Now, the essay that I have in mind by... Jean-Francois Lyotard is, um, let me just turn to the page, it's called What is Postmodernism? Answering the question, What is Postmodernism? And the essay covers quite a bit of ground. He first discusses realism and then moves in to the postmodern. And what characterizes realism is really a contrast to the postmodern. Throughout the essay, what he tries to do is he he tries to set realism against the postmodern. And one of the things that characterizes realism is its allegiance to a long tradition of representational art so you you might just think of any classical painting, the Mona Lisa, um, anything that represented a landscape of any sort. And what Leotard does is he juxtaposes modernistic tendencies to realistic tendencies and tries to show in the process where modernism is beginning to take shape. So, for example, think of some classic landscape painting from the 19th century. What goes through my mind immediately is maybe something from the Hungarian Museum of Art, because I spent a little bit of time in Budapest, and I remember a lot of paintings of dusty terrains and a lot of paintings that depicted the landscape of Hungary, especially peasant culture, I think maybe the years uh, that um, Hungary spent under uh, the Soviet Union might have had an influence on the paintings that were depicted there because a lot of them seem to show rural settings, peasant life, that sort of thing. And you might juxtapose to that as... Leotard does, um, not to Hungarian painting in particular, but to classical landscape paintings, what the Impressionists did, which was take us a step further away from realism, or what people like Picasso did, or what Brock did that moved us into Cubism and took us even further from realism. And as we get further and further into the modern era and these artists are beginning to move further and further away from the representation of a stable concept, the stable um, pictographical idea, and into something that's more abstract, Leotard argues that we are moving into the realm of the postmodern. 
And what I want to explain is just exactly how to connect the concept of sublimity with that way of thinking about modernity and uh, post-modernity. So let me take you directly to the quote where Lyotard talks about that movement. So he says, what do Picasso and Brock attack? Cezanne's. What presupposition does Duchamp break with, with 1912? That which says one must make a painting, be it cubist. And Buren questions that other presupposition which he believes had survived untouched by the work of Duchamp, the place of presentation of the work. In an amazing acceleration, the generations precipitate themselves. A work can become modern only if it is first postmodern. Postmodernism, thus understood, is not modernism at its end, but in the nascent state. And this state is constant. So going on, uh, I think it is worth moving on just a little bit further uh, and skipping down a little bit. The emphasis can be placed on the powerlessness of the faculty of presentation, on the nostalgia for presence felt by the human subject, on the obscure and futile, futile will which inhabits him in spite of everything. The emphasis can be placed rather on the power of the faculty to conceive on its quote-unquote inhumanity, so to speak. It was the quality Apollinaire demanded of modern artists, since it is not the business of our understanding whether or not human sensibility or imagination can match what it conceives. So let me, let me just explain those lines there, and that will take us directly into the concept of the sublime as Lyotard is trying to make use of it. So the Burkean notion of the sublime is probably the best place to start. Although the sublime as, a, as an aesthetic category probably owes its main uh, origination from a work by an author known as the Pseudo Longinus, uh, which I believe is simply entitled On the Sublime. And throughout Longinus's essay On the Sublime, he's trying to point out ways in which an aspiring writer might be able to work in elements of sublimity into his or her writing. And he brings in examples from Homer and the poets that are kind of transcendent, awe-inspiring moments in the text. But when we get to Burke, I, I think we do have a very interesting formulation of it that kind of reinvigorates the entire discussion of the sublime, which really comes more and more into vogue into the 19th century, and the 19th century is kind of the heyday of the sublime as the, as the topic gets mixed with the romanticism of the time period. And some of the classic examples that you can refer to in the Burkean notion of the sublime are, well, before I get to the examples, let me just explain the concept. So, with the Burkean sublime, the, the idea is that it's something very powerful that makes you kind of seize up or contract or um, kind of um, withdraw from its presence. And the, the image that you could relate to that would be something like an awe-inspiring chasm that there could be said to be some sublimity in that experience. Um, and it can't just be an experience of dread, like you might have a moment where you fear for your life staring into this chasm, but also a feeling of awe, uh, 
and a feeling of perhaps being drawn to the dreadfulness of the chasm in spite of the feelings of um, that, that sense that you want to withdraw from it for fear of your own safety. As Burke puts it, you, it, it is something that might invoke a certain fear for one's life. But at the same time, you are drawn to this, drawn to the experience. Perhaps there could be an element of perversity in the enjoyment of the danger of the experience that keeps one interested and looking and um, wanting to take in the experience something that draws you to it in spite of the danger, in other words. And another way of formulating it is to say that the sublime moment is one that is a mixture of pleasure and pain. And I think you can almost think of those terms, pleasure and pain, almost in, um, in the breadth of behavioristic categories. So the pleasure that one takes in it is is partly the the um the pleasure of the experience itself the pain is is the pain of being drawn towards something that is truly dangerous and in the let's say conflict um in the maybe contradiction uh in a certain sense out of the um, out of the unreasonableness of one's own enjoyment, there is this moment of sublimity. So you could also think of it in terms of another landscape, like seeing some mountains that are absolutely awe-inspiring. And I do believe that I experienced this for myself um, before I had any contact with Burke. I have some relatives who live in Wyoming. And at one point, I went into my grandmother's backyard and looked at the Rocky Mountains. And I hadn't really quite looked at them in quite the way that I looked at them at that moment. You could see there was this spray of snow that had been shot off the top of the, of the mountain um, by a, a very strong gust of wind. And you could see that. And you could also feel underneath it the, the weight of those mountains something dark about them, something that made you think that they might have been made of pure granite. It was just something about them that was just almost awe-inspiring, like something about the very weight of them, that if you thought about your own existence next to that mountain, made you feel very small and insignificant like the weight of these mountains and the danger that they might pose to human existence if you if you lived there in that desolate wintry setting was something that could feel a little bit life threatening could call up feelings of something like existential dread so let me switch now to the Kantian notion of the sublime, because once we understand the Kantian notion of the sublime, we can get into Lyotard's attempt to try to merge postmodern art and the sublime. Because it's probably not clear at this point exactly what the sublime has to do with modern art. If you think about abstract art, by somebody like Kandinsky, where is the awe-inspiring landscape that we're supposed to find a, a moment of sublimity when we look at it? You know, how exactly does that category apply? 
once we understand the Kantian sublime, I think it'll become clear. So with the Kantian sublime, the main point of interest for our discussion is simply that for Kant, there is a discontinuity in the normal functioning of our cognitive faculties when we encounter the sublime. And the way that it works is there is something in the aesthetic experience of the sublime that we can grasp with some higher part of our intelligence, some higher part of our understanding that cannot be fully conceptualized. So in the normal run of understanding, there's some sort of representation that can be brought together with a concept so that we have a firm sense that we understand a thing and the mind can come to rest once it has achieved that kind of unity of our sensory experience and our uh, higher cognitive experience. We're bringing together concepts and our perception of the world. And when that happens, the, the mind is able to kind of come to rest. But with the sublime, that moment where the mind is able to come to rest is indefinitely put off. That moment where the mind is allowed to come to rest is deferred because the mind hasn't quite been able to represent to itself what it is able to conceive intellectually. So if we return to the example of the mountains or the chasm, it isn't the image of the mountains or the chasm that counts as the sublime moment per se, but the way in which we experience the mountains or the chasm as something awe-inspiring. And within that awe, within the pleasure-pain dynamic that is included in that sense of awe, of something much greater than oneself, perhaps dangerous even, within the very sublimity of that sublime experience, there is something that cannot be adequately represented. There's, a, there's an incompleteness in the way that the mind is, is trying to relate this higher concept of sublimity to something that will adequately capture it. That is something more than the representation in the landscape itself is able to show. But when it comes to the sublime, there is nothing that adequately represents it. And instead, there is this element of excess, an, ex an element of excess, something that surpasses our ability to represent it. And by that very ex excess, our, our place where we can come to rest within our cognitive faculties is deferred. So there's deferral and excess. So let's come back to Lyotard. So with Lyotard, once again, as I was saying, he notices that as we move into modern art, and he says that the postmodern is what's really nascent in modern art that's giving it its modernity, is a move away from realism and straightforward representation toward something more abstract. And to the extent that the, that the artwork avoids or evades that traditional conception of painting that it should represent something and provide a stable reference point, it actually, in that sense, comes closer to sublimity. Because for Kant, the sublime is 
is characterized by that moment of excess, by that lack of continuity within one, in the normal functioning of one's cognitive faculties. There's a kind of rupture there that can't quite be healed in a certain sense. And again, it's, it's something that brings a deferral of rest. When it comes to looking at Kandinsky, there's no reason why somebody can't have that same feeling of the sublime. It may well be that the painter had not intended to evoke the sublime, but that's no hindrance on the observer. So the observer looking at a work of art that avoids and almost seems intentionally presented in such a way that it refer that it defers a coming to rest of the cognitive faculty, the faculty of understanding within the mind, nevertheless gives the mind a concept that is difficult to adequately represent by any other means. And that is really the basis for sublimity. One might feel a certain sense of awe, um, maybe a certain sense of even religious awe, depending upon the observer. But the further that we move into that kind of abstraction in modern art, the closer we might be said to be getting toward the very essence of sublimity itself. So those are my thoughts on Lyotard's essay. And with that, we can transition to some thoughts about tragedy. And the basis for these thoughts about tragedy come from an essay written by Jean-Francois Courtine, and the essay is called Tragedy and Sublimity. And through most of the essay, Courtine is concerned to try to characterize and explain Schelling's way of discussing the sublime and its relationship to tragedy. Now, the way that Schelling describes the sublime is slightly different from the way that Kant describes it and slightly different, again, from the way that Edmund Burke described it. And I will read that description to you. Courtine writes, It is in terms of these two different types of possible unity the infinite incorporated into the finite and the finite incorporated into the infinite, that Schelling distinguishes between sublimity and beauty. And here he quotes Schelling. The first unity, that which consists of the uniformation, Einbildung, of the infinite into the finite, finds its privileged expression in the work of art as sublimity. The second that which consists in the uniformation of the finite into the infinite as beauty. So the sublime is characterized as the infinite finding its way into finitude. And from that description, which is one that I already tried to work with a little bit earlier when I, I think I was talking about the chasm or maybe about the mountains, is meant to evoke the idea of incommensurability. So there's something that literally cannot be measured. There's something that surpasses all of our empirical resources of measuring and timing and comparing and dimensioning and relating in all sorts of ways to understand a thing in its physical nature, something that compels the mind to go beyond those physical categories that makes it very difficult for the mind to grasp exactly uh, 
what that thing is. And that's how I read the sense of infinitude that he is trying to invoke there. And that way of understanding the sublime is particularly well suited to the way that he discusses tragedy in one particular respect. And here it's um, by far the easiest to just try to think about the story of Oedipus Rex. Now, throughout the play, Oedipus Rex, Oedipus is in the position of a hero who has been condemned to a very, um, I guess you could say, unfortunate fate. Oedipus, despite his best efforts to master his fate, nonetheless falls into the hands of fate and experiences a very unfortunate realization that causes him to take the brooches, the pins that are holding his toga together and blind himself because he cannot stand the realization that has dawned upon him. Throughout the entire play, he has been heroically trying to use his reason, not succumb to the various suggestions that he did in fact kill his father and he is now sharing the same bed with his mother, um, which appears in the play as a progressively dawning realization. I don't know if I remember this correctly, but I am quite sure that there are many episodes that there are many references to Apollo throughout uh, the Oedipus play. I was just going to say I, I'm not entirely sure how much actual sun imagery comes in, but there are many, many ways in which the play refers to Apollo. And of course, Apollo is both the sun god and the god of reason. And it's almost as if and to really bring it together, I would have to refer back to the text of the play, but it's almost as if the astonishing power of the light of the sun, which is the true overarching rationality of Oedipus's destiny that is on its way to overcome him throughout the play, is finally something so blinding, so completely destructive in its blindingness that, Oep that Oedipus is almost perhaps self-preserving response is to put out his own eyes so that he won't have to experience the pain of that blinding light of realization that comes with the march of his own fate toward its inevitable conclusion. And what Schelling and Courtine, as a reader of Schelling, suggest is that it is that moment when the infinitude of the divine, so to speak, enters into our finite physical world uh, that we see the fullness of the realization of a destiny that couldn't have quite been grasped until that very moment by the main character, which is Oedipus. And it is a moment where his finitude comes into contact with the infinitude of that higher 
destiny that human beings can't comprehend in its fullness, except perhaps in that moment of being contacted with it. And even then, there is something in it that represents an excess, that represents a something more that can't be entirely fully grasped by human rationality. There is, of course, a way in which Oedipus himself grasps the idea of what he has done and that his fate has led him to this moment. But at the same time, the very divinity of it and his capacity to grasp himself in relationship to that divinity suggests that there is something in excess that is almost too powerful for it the light of his own reason to behold that might be compared to something like some of the experiences in the Hebrew scriptures when people encounter Yahweh. So what what more to say about that? Um, There are a couple of very important insights, I think, to take away from that image. And one of them is the paradox involved with freedom that also allows us to relate this idea of the tragic hero to other tragic heroes in the Greek tradition. So at the very moment when Oedipus finally realizes that He has not truly been free because he has always been living his life under the control of fate and destiny. Paradoxically, in that very moment, he achieves his greatest moment of freedom by finally being reconciled to the divine plan in his own reason, by finally coming into harmony with that plan, he experiences a kind of liberation that you can also see in the figure of someone like Prometheus, who being chained to a rock and having his liver pecked out by an eagle, I think, um, is also paradoxically in that moment of rebellion most fully exposing himself before the gods, before humanity. And in that moment of pain and perhaps even injustice, he is paradoxically in his own self-exposure and self-revelation his most liberated. So from there, let me just take you to my final resource for this evening, which is Joseph Campbell. And I'm going to try to relate the idea of the tragic hero, as I've just described in ancient Greece to some broader themes that connect the difference between Occidental or Western mythology and religion to Eastern religion and mythology. So exactly where that split takes place. And Campbell thinks that it really comes down to the beginnings of a sense of the human being opposed to the divine. And to come back to the figure of Oedipus for a moment, the sense in which the human, in the experience of his humanity, really has only two choices. One is a kind of fatalism that says, there's nothing I can do to change my destiny 
whatever the gods throw my way is simply something that I have to accept and I can't take any control of my fate or my destiny. The other path is the heroic path that says I must exist, I must be, I can't simply give in to the cruelty of fate. I have to do whatever I have to do to exalt my humanity as much as possible. And these tragic heroes of Greek mythology and um, of the Greek plays are people who take that heroic path and become people who exemplify heroic elements of humanity. They are people who oppose the divine with their own humanity and always do so unsuccessfully, do so knowing that they will be condemned, but nevertheless do so anyway, which leads to the theme of suffering as something that is counted as noble in the Western tradition. There is a kind of nobility to a suffering that amounts to striving against odds that may even be impossible, that amount to a sacrifice of oneself. And if done heroically enough, can amount to a kind of liberation. So let me, let me come back to Joseph Campbell. So he says, as the Japanese Zen Buddhist philosopher Daisetsu Suzuki once said, summarizing what seemed to him to be the characteristic Western spiritual situation, quote, man is against God, nature is against God, and man and nature are against each other. Whereas, in contrast, according to his argument, if God created the world, he created man as part of it, as belonging to it, as organically related to it. And there is something divine in being spontaneous and being not at all hampered by human conventionalities and their artificial, sophisticated hypocrisies. There is something direct and fresh in this not being restrained by anything human. And indeed, there is. But the whole spiritual history of the West, since circa 2350 BC, has been the long weaning of its own part of humanity away from this sublime daemonism. Campbell goes on to say, a strain of criticism is implicit already in the Sumerian myth of creation, where the virtue of man is described as that of a slave made for the pleasure of the gods. Such a myth represents not worship, essentially, but a comment. In, and in such comment, the Orient is lost, the Occident is born. The metaphysical tremendum, and here's where we get into the sublime, the metaphysical tremendum, the deep awe before the great unchanging truth and the full submission of all human judgment to a mystery unnamed, which is infinite, impersonal, yet intimately within all beings, all things, and in death too. These have been the sentiments that in the Orient have remained honored as the most holy. And from the point of view of the knowledge in rapture of that full void, the dedication of the Occidental mind to the merely personal affairs of men and women living in the world appears to represent only the loss of the fruit of life, that which the little girl found beside the Ganges when she went with her husband into the earth. So he goes on to discuss Egypt a little bit and, uh, I found this discussion to be very interesting. It's included in his book, 
called Oriental Mythology in the Masks of God series, which I think is about a six-volume series or so, um, and just tremendous scholarship behind it. But what I would just like to draw your attention to to bring this to a close is that the idea of human suffering is something that seems to breed a kind of uh, distance between the human and divine, which is something that, according to Campbell, becomes more and more part of a, a part of the Western culture, becomes seminal to it. And with the Oriental tradition, there's something almost rapturous in the way that they have tried to overcome suffering, if you think of Buddhism, and move beyond it toward a experience of the divine by getting beyond suffering. So what I'll, what I'll say about this is just that historically, the experience of suffering that the, that the West brings into its mythology through figures like Prometheus and Oedipus and the whole motif of fatalism versus a heroic approach to life seems to coincide with the period after the Bronze Age collapse. And I won't go into that too much because I've been at this for a little while now, but when you look at the literature from ancient Greece, when you look at even the literature from Anglo-Saxon England at that time, if you look at poems like the Seafarer, you see a definite sense of gloom. You see a definite sense of fatalism, a sense that nature has turned against man. And I think the way to understand this, which might seem very foreign to uh, a more modern Christian way of thinking about our relationship to God is simply to recall that at this time, or in this, in this cultural milieu, people look at nature and they associate nature with the divine. So they see the forces of nature as something far greater than themselves and suffused with divinity and destiny and fate are really kind of the ultimate ways in which nature and the universe may eventually conspire against humanity to bring about sorrow and tragedy. And a lot of Western thinking seems to be centered in this particular time period around the problem of human suffering and why it is that humans seem to suffer at the hands of these divine cosmic forces and what sort of sense of justice or injustice is to be taken away from our thinking about that. But from the Greek standpoint, it seems that one response really was to say that there is something noble and heroic about being human, being a frail, small human who is mortal and is inevitably, inevitably um, subject to all the sorrows and pains that nature and the cosmos may bring his way and still striving mightily to assert his humanity and try to master fate in the fate of that inevitability. And I think we also at this point have to recall the extent to which archaic man really was subject to the winds of fate when it comes to things like whether the crops would grow, whether there would be a famine, um, you know, life expectancy was much less, um, child 
deaths and deaths in childbirth were far more frequent and common. And one can only imagine that in such a world, survival was much more of a priority and people's experience of suffering was much more a regular part of their lives. So with that, I think these three sources were really quite outstanding reading. And I'll say goodnight.